You hear about all these stories, Lacey Peterson, Gabby Petito. Right now we are investigating this missing person. Petito disappeared. Families desperate to find this missing woman. But the outpouring of attention and the outpouring of reaction is so different in those cases. The FBI has now joined this. This girl right here, this is what matters. Anything else, it comes second to this. And it doesn't happen for us. This is Elizabeth. She's been missing now for 48 hours. Our police are working with the FBI. There are murdered and missing indigenous women who just vanish. They disappear and nobody looks for them. I was born in Chinle, Arizona. That's where my mom's family is from. What's it like growing up on the reservation? It was beautiful. The land was beautiful. It's definitely a, a lot of driving because everything's so isolated. So I remember growing up, it took a long time to travel anywhere to Chinle or even to the grocery store. It was about an hour away to the kind of main town for a long time growing up, a pretty typical family. Mom, dad, myself, my brothers, and took trips to Disneyland, and I feel like we actually had a very good childhood growing up till the end. My name is Tiffany Sorrell. I am Laverta's eldest daughter. Do you remember the day she went missing? I do remember um, I do remember most of it. So my name is Valina Guy. Laverta was my older sister. Valina remembers that day too, in 2002. It was July 4th. She was getting ready to head to Texas. I wanted to call her and let her know that I was getting ready to go and that I'd call her and let her know how things were going once I got there and um, she didn't answer. Alina didn't think much of it at the time. Meanwhile, Laverta's kids were out too. I drove my brothers to the fair, which is funny because I know I was only 14. <laughs> we hung out, I, I was a teenager, hanging out with my friends and stuff. You know, I started to kind of lose a little track of time because I was getting a little bit worried, like, oh, I need to get home, we have curfew. Tiffany's parents, Laverta and Edison, were also out celebrating that night, but for a different reason. They went to dinner for their anniversary. When we got home, nobody was there. Nobody was home, and so I, I, at that time, I kind of just thought it was a little strange. The next thing I kind of remember, though, is waking up to police officers in my room. Edison told Tiffany, her brothers, and police that after their anniversary dinner, Laverta asked to be dropped off at work at the Fort Defiance School District around 11.30 p.m. We went at 8 that night, and she kept wanting to leave and leave and leave and then I just kept telling her, wait till the morning, you know. I said, I can drop you off in the morning. And she said, no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go right now and stuff. But she, she was ad adamant about wanting to go that night for I don't know what reason. Was it normal for her to ask to be dropped off at, at school, at her office at night? No, mm -mm. There was just something that started to, to go off in my head a little bit. And I was like, why hasn't she called? She'll be back. I'd just give her a few days, you know, and then she just never returned. That's the story we were told. That was 21 years ago. 21 years. The average amount of time Native women go missing in Arizona. It's a crisis and also an epidemic. It has its own acronym, MMIW 
missing and murdered Indigenous women. It's something Darlene Gomez knows all too well. I started investigating it and then someone else went missing. And then someone else went missing and then someone else went missing. So then that priority becomes the next person that goes missing. Darlene grew up on a reservation. She's now an attorney by trade. Since 2020, she's worked pro bono for 20 Native families who have missing or murdered loved ones in Arizona and New Mexico. These families can't barely afford to do flyers for their loved ones and to put gas in their cars to look for them. What often begins as domestic violence ends in decades-long mystery or death. Darlene says the more you learn about why, the more frustrating it gets. You may be trying to get a hold of the police and it may take you three or four days. I've heard the stories, I've heard about people making phone calls and not being taken seriously. Any district at any given time, we may have two to four officers on shift. When it comes to investigating these crimes and prosecuting them, those in charge agree too many cases have slipped through the cracks. Arizona is, is the third worst in the country for missing and murdered indigenous people, third worst. How do you guarantee the people of Navajo Nation that this is a safe place to live when you do have women and girls going missing? It's, it's gonna be a very difficult task to guarantee that right now in this moment in time. It's the system. The system is broken and, and we're a part of that system. You know it's spiraled out of control when state leaders admit their offices have been part of the problem. And this is the result. How do you tell little children that their mother is gone and everybody in town is saying they know who killed her? Or when they say, Miss Darlene, when's my mom coming home? And all you can tell them is like, I don't know. One of the 20 families Darlene represents, the Sorrel family. That means she knows every detail of the case, the good, the bad, and the ugly. When did you notice some sort of shift in your parents' relationship or maybe the family dynamic? It was until middle school. Eighth grade around there is when they started to fight a lot. It eventually came out that she was having an affair. That July 4th anniversary dinner was going to be Edison and Laverta's last. They eventually sat me down and, and told me that they were gonna get a divorce. I was talking to her about, you know, why don't we work this out? You know, why don't we do this? And, and she told me, she says, I'm afraid of that guy. He can do stuff. And I said, what do you mean by that? She wouldn't tell me specifically. And I told her, what does she mean? Is he threatening you? Is he threatening the kids? And she said, no, no, he knows stuff. It was an ominous conversation, but Edison says he knew it didn't matter. Laverta was still choosing another man and would often go spend time with him. So when she asked to be dropped off after their dinner at the school district just before midnight, he says he obliged. This was an ongoing thing for a whole year. And she was leaving for months at a time, wanting to come back and she comes back. Then she leaves again and she comes back. So it was kind of a routine thing. So when she left that night, you know, I, I didn't think of anything, you know, because she's done that before. The question was, who was he? Who was the man she met at the school district? I told the FBI that, you know, she was concerned about him, that he, he knew stuff. As Laverta's family uncovered details, suspicion swirled deeper. She didn't even have her work keys with her to get into the building. Her keys were later found at her home. We didn't even know if that was really the last place that she was seen. Now we're like five, six days in, and no one has seen her, no one has heard from her. It would take more time than it should, but the case was about to take a sharp and pointed turn. Um, when, they, when the FBI told us that they were going to go from a missing persons case to a homicide, I knew that um, they were finally on the right track. Call the police.
send somebody to her house right now. Something's wrong. There was no urgency in their response. It was, you know, well, give it a couple of days, and then, you know, if she's not home in a couple of days, and then we'll, we'll look into it even more. Those five days turned into weeks, turned into months, turned into years. The panic that you have just develops into something more. It was super frustrating, um, beyond words. The frustration from the Sorrell family isn't an isolated story. It's one we've repeatedly heard from Native families. To even begin to unravel how this crisis has exploded, I knew we had to start on the reservation itself, where these investigations begin. It's crazy actually being here and seeing the reservation for the first time, because I feel like you have these picturesque views, you've got these mountains, you've got these rocks. It's so pretty, and yet the actual life and the lifestyle here is it's hard to drive by and see. I mean, there's barely any grocery stores or restaurants, and you've got these families that are living in really awful conditions. And so just thinking about the project and, and actually witnessing this in person, it becomes clear why these families are fighting for anything. Attention, focus, resources. We're sitting here just listening to the birds chirping. It's, it's peaceful. And yet so many of these families are dealing with anything but peace. They need help. Daryl Noon, D-A-R-Y-L-N-O-O-N. I'm the chief of police for the Navajo Police Department. I changed, you know, the way that I policed, and that's what I'm trying to change here. It's a tough spot for the Navajo Nation police chief to be in. When did you take over as chief? January of last year. Daryl Noon knows there's a problem with how they've been treating cases. The Navajo Police Department is a separate department from the criminal investigations. And so it, it really, uh, it made it difficult. We have funding for more officers. The problem is hiring officers. We lose a lot of potential applicants and backgrounds. And for this last academy class where we started 17, we had over 100 applicants. And uh, So only 17 passed background checks? Yeah, started the academy. It's become so dire, even the bare minimum isn't being done. In our Shiprock district, our jail is closed. So every time an officer makes an arrest, they got to take them to the hospital to get a clearance. Then they've got to travel an hour, an hour and a half away to, to book them into another facility and then come back. So they make an arrest, they're, they're out of pocket for four to five hours. So do you think they're not making arrests when they should because of those conditions? I, 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 I'd have to say that that happens. You know, and, and I, I, I hate to admit that, but you know, this is the current state of, of where we're at right now. While the Navajo Nation is a sovereign nation, President Boo Nigren knows they need help. Right now the issue is, is that just to take a phone call, let's say it's a burglary or speeding, there's barely enough resources for that. How much extra funding do you need to even get up to a level that would feel acceptable or adequate to be able to properly investigate these kind of cases? I think if, I don't know the exact number, but if I were to assume it would be in the millions. The way to get funding, prove how desperate the problem has become. We'll partner with a research university, comb through existing data, backtrace it back to tribal enrollment numbers, and create a database. This data didn't exist until just a few years ago. Jennifer Germain is the reason why that changed. She's a former state representative who led the first ever study committee on MMIW in Arizona. The goal was to try and organize data to figure out where to even start to fix this. And what we found was that people were being murdered from infant all the way into their 90s. And what we found is that over that 40 year period, there was a steady increase in the murder rates. We were only able to get the numbers that were reported what has been reported is significantly less than what is out there. 
Some states are required to report missing persons to a database called NamUs. It's a huge resource for missing Indigenous women. Arizona is not required to do that. Do you feel the biggest barrier right now is the fact that it's not getting the vote it needs to be required? Yeah. How do you change the minds of lawmakers that don't see that as a priority? A lot of it comes down to personal conversations and a lot of it comes down to making sure that they see these people as real people and that these families as real families. One of the big things that helped was we had a whole bunch of Native women who just came down here and they camped out in the stairwells and told every lawmaker their story. It shouldn't have to take that. I understand why people don't trust uh, uh, government sometimes, especially uh, on this issue, because frankly, government has failed them. Government has failed them. Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays is already working on getting extra funding to our reservations for training and resources. But often a case is escalated not to the state level, but to the federal level. That's what happened in Laverta Sorrell's case, but not right away. Eventually it did become an FBI case. It did get referred to um, federal investigators. Akil Davis, AKIL, DAVIS, Special Agent in Charge, FBI Phoenix. And we have 22 reservations here in the state, and the FBI has responsibility for homicides, crimes against children, uh, and major assaults. Do you guys pick up missing people cases or missing persons cases on the reservation if there's no body yet? Um, it depends. Going missing isn't necessarily a crime because adults can, can leave at their, at their own free will. So um, that's why I can't stress enough, it really depends on the circumstances of how this person went missing. Laverta Sorrell has been missing for 21 years. The circumstances of her disappearance were enough for the FBI to classify it as a homicide case. Her sister Valina says that hasn't made the difference they hoped it would. So we're actually on our fifth FBI investigator and we really don't know what they are doing. We really don't know what they're uncovering or what they're investigating. I don't know, the priority for Native American women, I, I hate to believe that, but it's just not there for the FBI. What's your response to those families who say, I can't even get a hold of the FBI agent on this case? Yeah, so we, we have a duty agent that's here 24 seven, so they can always get a hold of an FBI agent, but I cannot stress enough that the FBI does not frequently provide updates to family members because we want to protect the integrity of the investigation. Is the worry that sharing updates, let's just say every few months, that that would leak information out to somebody you wouldn't want it to get to? Exactly, exactly that. So you try to keep things more under wrap, even if that's not the family's wishes. That's correct. In order to, because of that ultimate goal I said, is successful prosecution. It's not just Laverta Sorrell's case the FBI has been working on. Jamie Yazzie's family, they've had to go boots on the ground. The last phone call was the night that she supposedly went missing. It made me so mad. I was like, I knew it. I couldn't remember her last words of, I'll call you gals later. I knew it, that's what I said. Yeah, I would go truck stops. I run out the uh, uh, flyers, pass them out. I go out to border Mexico, along there, Tucson, and uh, some truck drivers, they would say, give me a whole bunch, I'll, I'll, I'll post it on the way to Texas. Then I go all the way up to uh, Gallup and New Mexico. Sometime I eat lunch, and dinner there at QT's parking lot. Looking for her? Yeah. Life on the road, it's lonely, isolating. With ailing health, it's grueling. 
but the love a father has for his daughter knows no bounds. I did the search out there with my cane, but uh, it, it was too rough for me. James Yazi is sick. His days are numbered. I couldn't get up. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, move. But he would do anything for his daughter, Jamie Yazi. His health had to come second to finding her. It's been hard uh, three years, I guess. It, it, uh, not knowing if she's out there and uh, just hoping that, that she will come back home. And I texted her and I asked her to meet me because I wanted to go to this concert that we we're invited to. Hey woman, you know, get ready. We're going to this concert. I waited about an hour and I was waiting for her to text me back. Nothing, no response. It was unlike Jamie not to respond to her aunt, Marilyn. Jamie lived in Pinon, Arizona. A mom to three young boys and a nursing assistant at a pediatric health center on the Navajo Nation. She loved her job. She loved the kids. She loved the elders. She was just a really good people person. So it seems strange when texts sent to Jamie from her aunt and her sister went unanswered. The last phone call was the night that she supposedly went missing. I could remember her last words of, I'll call you gals later. That call never came. Last anyone knew, Jamie had been at her boyfriend, Trey James's house. And maybe her and Trey got into a fight or an argument or she's just taking a break somewhere. Jamie was divorced and found new love in Trey. The last conversation I had with her, I know she was telling me how much of a good person he is to her and how he took care of her. The rumor mill fueled a different story one of immediate concern. I know everybody else was saying that he did shoot her. I told my daughter, let's go drive around town. So my oldest came with me. We drove through Pinon. We went to my sister's house. Countless searches for days became weeks, months, years. Every day I just waiting to hear that song. Jamie's back. And finally, Marilyn found the unthinkable, every bit of it seared in her memory. A little past the Hopi line on the Hopi reservation. Like me breathing in the thick air and then you know it's so cold outside. And there was a moon out and um, I fell to the ground and I, you know, I picked up the sand. I thought it was sand, it was um, snow. It was melting through my fingers. A woman appeared from behind a rock. Marilyn couldn't believe what she was seeing. It was Jamie. She came out and I was like, where were you, woman? You know, I went to hug her and she was a bit taller than me. So when I looked at her, she had a sand in her eyelashes, sand in her hair. So I told her, tell me what happened. Tell me everything, I told her. And she kept looking into this, it was like a rock formation. That's where she came out from. She kept looking that way. And I told her, is there anybody in there with you? And she goes, no, but I have to go back soon. And then I said, well, just tell me what happened. And she said, I love you, Ma. And, um, but I could hear it so close to my ear. That's when I woke up from that dream. That dream was just so real. The thing about dreams, sometimes it's a thin veil between them and reality. Something told Marilyn to go to the area she saw so vividly in her dream. I kind of had a feeling like I knew which right road to take, so I took that road with my friend and my sisters, and we found her wallet. It was empty, but we found her wallet. Jamie's family made the discovery on November 29th, 2021. They had her wallet, but no sign of her. They gave it to the FBI, and I guess his question was, how does she know where to find it? That's 
seemed like an odd response. Three months later, they'd find out why. Oh, we found her. We found her. And I said, good, where was she? Where was she and where is she now? And they said, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that we just found her remains. And I was alone. I was alone in the house. That really hit me hard then because in the past, I really had that hope that she was somewhere. It was positively identified as Jamie. Her remains were found November 23rd of 2021. November 23rd. That was just six days before Jamie's family found the wallet and turned it into investigators. They were never told a body was discovered. When they asked for an update in January 2022, the answer, there was nothing new. To Jamie's family, that now feels like a lie. My first question was, where did they find her? And she said, a little past the Hopi line on the Hopi reservation. And it made me so mad. I was like, I knew it, you know, I knew it. I knew it, that's what I said. We just wanted simple, you know, simple answers as far as um, the questions we had. We didn't want it in details, you know, we just, we knew it was still open. We just did not, you know, we just wanted to know if she was okay. Then, a daunting thought. We showed up there on the 29th, and they found her on the 23rd. I'm thinking, if we left sooner, would we have found her? Eventually, several pages of court documents would be released. 15 pages, each one telling the story of what happened to Jamie Yazzie in the summer of 2019. And it's more unsettling than anyone was prepared for. Trey James and the victim had been arguing about infidelity on the night of June 30th, 2019, and early July 1st, 2019. On or before 1.13 a.m. on July 1st, 2019, the victim's phone was either turned off or no longer working, and efforts of family and friends to contact her were left unanswered. The victim was killed by a gunshot wound to the back of her head. On July 12th, 2019, investigators searched the blue house and found floor tile with a red colored substance that appeared to be blood in the bedroom believed to be used by the victim and Trey James. Drywall and baseboard with a red color substance that appeared to be blood. A queen size mattress stripped of bedding with stains and what appeared to be partial burning in the bedroom. Pieces of wall with what appeared to be blood in the hallway. A red colored substance that appeared to be blood on the front porch. A small pistol in the living room. And when they searched that house though, there was, there was blood evidence in there that could have been tested. I mean, did you have to have Jamie Yazzie's remains to, to charge Trey James? We're not gonna charge a case unless we have what we call a readily provable case. I trust our team. That's what I have to do as United States Attorney. And our team didn't feel comfortable charging the case to a standard by which we would prevail at trial. Evidence from inside the home was sent to Quantico for the FBI to test in 2019. The results didn't come back for more than two years, just a couple months before Jamie's body was found. On September 7, 2021, the FBI lab issued a report finding that A, there is blood on the floor tile and strong evidence that it is the victim's blood, and B, there is blood on the drywall and baseboard and strong evidence that it is the victim's blood. In August 2022, Trey James was arrested for first-degree murder in the death of Jamie Yazzie, three years after she disappeared. The indictment revealed a sinister reality. In the time it took to get evidence testing back from Quantico, 
Trey James assaulted and attempted to suffocate and strangle at least three other women after Jamie was killed. There's other people that went missing in Pinon, and that makes me wonder, like, did he have a hand in anything else like that? Why would it take that long for evidence to come back from Quantico? Yeah, because that's how busy Quantico is. I mean, they handle all of the evidence for the FBI. So if you think of all those violations in which the FBI is responsible for, and I can't stress that there's not another federal law enforcement agency in the world that is set up like the FBI with all of the responsibility we have. Is there a backlog at Quantico with evidence? Um, I would assume so. So for the Phoenix Division, Indian Country is one of our highest threats here. That's how we've prioritized that here. But the problem is if you send it to Quantico, that might not be the same Correct. priority level. Correct. We need the forensic evidence, and sometimes it can take a year or two to get the results of forensic evidence back. These cases are difficult not just because of the forensics, but because we sometimes have to find the human remains before they can even be tested. Trey James faces a potential maximum sentence of life in prison, but his time behind bars could be far less. As far as right now, they're telling us that, you know, it's crime of passion, you know, like, he's not going to get more than 25 years. So that's what they're telling us. They're telling you 25 years is going to be a maximum mm -hmm. outcome? Yeah. Yeah. Where would they be hearing that 25 years from? So 25 years, 25 years is, is, is um, what would be a likely scenario under the indictment. It would be um, simply discussions of the possible things that happen in trial. It's all been more than the Yazi family can bear, and it's nowhere near over. He took a mom. From three handsome boys, my oldest grandson, Ethan, he's, he's full of anger. It makes me mad, but I deal with my anger through tears. Still waiting for a daily phone call from her or for her to come out to here to like pop up and be like, just kidding, I'm here. <sighs> yeah, it's just what I think about every day. You hear about missing women mm -hmm. all the time, yeah. and a lot of them get a lot of publicity on the news and social media and there's a, an urgency to test DNA and evidence and find an answer. Where do you think Jamie's case falls into that priority list? The lowest, if not nowhere. It's not there. We're not, we don't even make that list. That's what I, that's how I felt. Even up to this day, it's hard to talk about my niece and not cry about it. Jamie Yazzie's sons will grow up with a massive void and be forced to learn how to make sense of it all. One person in particular can relate. I don't think I knew how much it affected me until I got older and started going to therapy <laughs> and learning about your trauma response to certain things. As Tiffany got older, she learned more about her mom's case and the investigation. Actually, um, the man that she was having an affair with, he has been ruled out. He's taken a lie detector and he's participated in the investigation. So what other direction could it go? Tiffany isn't a teenager anymore. When the pieces to her mom's puzzle never seemed like they quite fit, it dawned on her. Maybe the only direction this case could go was the direction she hoped it never would. If something doesn't make sense, it's probably not true. And so, in this narrative that he's sharing about dropping her off, um, it just didn't make any sense. I feel like karma happened.
Lorenz. My sister was a human being. She had family that loved her. She had children. We get victim blaming. We get shame. It's as if the very women everyone was looking for were given a scarlet letter, a shameful label imprinted on the minds of their families, their children. She was an alcoholic or that she used drugs. That's what was told to us. That is kind of what halted a lot of the push to want to look for her. It was a wake-up call for Jamie Yazzie's aunt, Marilyn. She realized subconsciously she too had been part of the problem. The things they said about Jamie after she went missing is what I used to say about them. You know, other women that went missing. Victim shaming and all that stuff. I didn't know about that. And that's what I was doing before that happened to Jamie. I feel bad for thinking that way or even saying those things because now that's where we're at with Jamie. Victim blaming wasn't the only issue. They were taught growing up on the reservation, you don't talk about the dead. And I think majority of the the, the Native Americans are just taught to push everything under the rug or to let it go or, you know, there's nothing that's going to be done. Nobody cares. For the Yazi family, the solution starts here, changing a narrative they no longer believe. Our older generation of the like Native Americans, we were always told, I did just sweep it under the rug, just leave it alone, basically. But I think the younger generation is like, no, we, we're not going to do that. It's a pivotal time for us to do this documentary, a regime change across the entire state. New leaders with new perspectives and the power to act. Before you got to this role, what was your knowledge of the MMIW crisis in Arizona? Well, really, um, it was kind of more what I was hearing um, being talked about nationally and a little bit in the state. I'm thankful because I didn't realize the problem was as big as, as it is here in Arizona. We interviewed 16 people for this project. The Arizona governor was one of the last, and that was good because after everything we learned, there was a lot to bring to her attention. Just getting this um, on the front page, um, having the, the weight of the governor's office behind it, I think is really critical to help making it a priority for those law enforcement agencies that are charged with investigating and solving these crimes. It starts with tribal police, like Chief Daryl Noon and his department at the Navajo Nation. Within the Navajo Police Department, we created a small detective division. We're going to start doing um, cold case highlights. And what we're hoping to accomplish with that is bring in family members from the older cases and make sure that they've all submitted DNA. Because of the recruits failing background checks, they're weighing the possibility of lowering their hiring age to 18. In Arizona, you must be 21 to be a police officer. Does that worry you, though, that now you are, you are trying to recruit people who might not be ready? They would have to be 18 by the time they applied, so which means they'll graduate from the academy right around 19, maybe. And, and what we're looking to do is put those officers in two officer units. The idea is to get a hold of them, get them in the door before they go and do something stupid that you know ruins their chances. Policing is one tribal aspect. The Navajo Nation president is sorting out another. One of the things I want to focus on is to really move into digitizing a lot of our efforts. Because even right now, you, if someone does report something, it might be on paper. And what if it gets lost? The governor and attorney general seem to be taking steps to strengthen their relationship with our tribes and commit to change. 
They created a new Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Task Force this year with plans already set in motion. My aim is to hire at least one more prosecutor and one more investigator, if not more. My office needs to provide and will be providing additional tra training to the state's 22 tribes. It begins with just the basics things most of us take for granted. One thing that would help is if we could get broadband to the entire Navajo Nation. It's hard to report crimes when you can't call it in. Our goal is 100% connectivity in the state. While that's a start, during our months of research, it became clear two more issues needed to be addressed. I see a real break in how we collect data here, and part of that is other states are required to report missing cases to NamUs, the database NamUs, which is huge. Arizona is not required to do that. Is that something you can change? Uh, it would probably need a statutory change. Reliable data is crucial. So is evidence testing coming back in a reasonable amount of time. Obviously, the FBI is, is a department of the federal government. If they're not doing due diligence on these crimes that, that, that they reprioritize and make them a priority. The problem is, instead of going to a state lab, all evidence processed on a federal case is only being sent to the FBI's lab at Quantico, where it can take years to be processed, like in Jamie's case. Is this something you could take to President Biden and say, we need more help in Arizona to yeah, fight this? Yeah, it's absolutely something I'd be willing to have that conversation with him about. Until change happens, Darlene is overwhelmed with messages from Native families desperate for help. Arizona, New Mexico, I'm getting calls from the Dakotas, from Montana, from Alaska, California. It's really expanded. We've really been trying to ride the wave that occurred after Gabby Petito. Did that help or hurt? It helped us tremendously because then we were able to get out there and do our videos and use the media, Facebook. And then one story became two stories and then three stories, four, five stories. And we've gotten over, you know, close to a million views on Jamie Ozzie's family. For the first time, there's been a feeling of hope. The first case I worked on was solved. The second case I worked on was solved. Jamie Ozzie's case, is going to be tried soon. It's being tried by the U.S. Attorney's Office. The relationship between the federal government and the Yazi family has had its ups and downs. We are doing our part in empowering victims if they are telling their story, even if their story isn't always supportive of the government and its investigation. We do need to listen more. We got to make sure we're not suffering from, um, from white woman in the van syndrome. You know, referring to these rep high profile cases when a, a high profile person goes missing and everybody suddenly cares. We need to treat Native American cases on the reservation the same way. But how do you truly stop this when it's gone on for hundreds of years? We need more resources into mental health care. We need more resources into behavioral health especially in rural communities, especially in tribal communities. It's not going to be solved overnight. We have a lot of work to do. I was only 14, so I don't think I really understood the dynamics of relationships at that time. With age came understanding and desire to make a difference in the MMIW crisis. Tiffany Sorrell wants to know what happened to her mom. Her personal story through a child's eyes is powerful already, but now she's claiming back power in her 30s on nobody else's terms but her own, even if it means what she believes as an adult casts suspicion on her own father. So do you think your dad has a, a part in your mom's disappearance? The way I think about it is, if something doesn't make sense, it's probably not true. Pretty much I told him that I think he had something to do with it. Can I very simply ask you point blank if you were involved in her disappearance, yes or no? She 
She worked as a resource secretary in the schools there. It was around that time that she met Edison, and he had lived in Navajo, New Mexico at the time. They had known each other for a while. They used to do a lot of like fishing. He'd go out and hunt and was really outdoorsy. Did you like him? No. It was really just about himself. He didn't really care about her feelings or didn't do anything special for her. Do you believe that's what led to her having an affair? Yeah. Valina called her sister Laverta's home for days after she went missing. Nobody picked up until a few days later, somebody finally did. But when I called her home and Edison answered the phone and my immediate reaction to him answering was, what did you do? What, what did you do to her? And I don't know, like that just came out. And then he hung up the phone. It wasn't until probably I got to college maybe that me and my younger brother, Nick, started to really have conversations and kind of start talking about what do you think happened? Because things aren't adding up. Edison told police he dropped his wife off at the Fort Defiance School District that night around 11.30 p.m. and assumed she was meeting the man whom she was having an affair. When Tiffany got home from the fair that night, she found herself in an empty house. That for me was just so, it just st still sticks out to me today is like, where was everybody in this span of time? So do you think your dad has a, a part in your mom's disappearance? The way I think about it is, if something doesn't make sense, it's probably not true. In this narrative that he's sharing about dropping her off, it just didn't make any sense. It seemed like he just wanted to move forward. He didn't seem like he cared to. It was kind of like she didn't exist anymore. She just, she just was gone and that was it. I had to ask Edison Sorrell about all of this. And to my surprise, he had a lot to say. I let her go that day, that night. You know, the guy that she was with, she had really high hopes of He was on a, a high pedestal. But he was also seeing other girls around town, not only her. Well, the authorities have cleared him in the case. What's your reaction to that? Um, I don't know. Did you take a lie detector or a polygraph test? No, I don't want to. I got advice from the lawyer. Is FBI or... or uh, are pressured by her side of the family to, to, to provide, you know, to, to uh, solve this thing. Don't you want this solved too? I mean, it is your ex-wife. I know, you know, I, I like to, you know, I still hope she's out there, you know, I mean, hoping she'll come, come back. Can I very simply ask you point blank if you were involved in her disappearance, yes or no? No, I wasn't involved in it, and I'm not, I had nothing to do with it. Like I said, I cooperated with the police. In 2021, Tiffany wrote her dad a letter, one she never planned to send. It was just to help her heal. Eventually, she found the courage to pick up the phone and tell her dad what's been weighing on her heart. I told him that I was going to get more involved with the MMIW and that, that I know that he loved me and I know that he was hurt by her affair. But I said, I also think that essentially that something happened that night, that you had pretty much, I told him that I think you had something to do with it. He did send me a text message saying, well, I guess this is goodbye. And so I just kind of thought, okay, well, I guess this is going to be a broken relationship. I still love them. I don't care you know, what they say or what they do. You know, if they feel that way, that's fine. Um, um, I still care about them. They're still welcome here into my home. Do you think your mom is alive now? I don't think she would go this long without reaching out to her family, her children. Do you think she died that night? 
I think so. What do you believe happened to your sister? I think she was murdered. Do you think your sister's case will be solved? I do. Jamie Yazzie went missing in 2019. Her body was found in 2021. Years later, her family is still fighting for the one thing that means the most. You still don't have Jamie's remains? No. What have you been told on that? Um, that's the best evidence they had to convict in him. And that they need it through the whole case? Yes. I mean, that's not normal. It doesn't feel normal. Jamie's sons have asked their grandmother when they can have a funeral. How long is it going to take? How long are they going to hold on to mom when she needs to be put to rest? Jamie's dad is holding on as long as he can. Now they're telling me my heart, my kidney, my liver, and my lungs are so <laughs> giving up. So <laughs> I'm just hanging in there to uh, seek justice for my daughter. Those in charge of getting justice and making change are also struggling. We were stunned to learn members of their own families are among the forgotten. My great-grandfather was a missing person for 65 years. He survived the Eastern Front of World War I to come home and go missing from a New Deal work site in Yellowstone National Park. One of my childhood friends, Melissa Montoya, went missing on St. Patrick's Day in 2001. And to this day, she's never been found. And only up to about two and a half months ago was the FBI able to enter her picture in. So for 21 years, she remained faceless, a silhouette. And that's not justice for anyone. I didn't really talk about this until recently, but my grandmother, her brother is missing. Uh, she's 95, going on 96 in March. She's going to leave this place never knowing what happened. It's tough. I'm just watching her go through it. We know you know who you're looking for. This is Elizabeth. What these families saw in the media didn't reflect their own anguish. This girl right here, this is what matters. That is it. Anything else becomes second to this. Once Gabby went missing, Gabby Petito went missing, it really did open my eyes like it is skin color. We're pushed aside because of our skin color. We're just, you know, put last because of our skin color. That's something they will no longer accept. I think if we stop fighting, I'm gonna let them tell you a little bit about Jamie. That's when and this is my niece Jamie. That Jamie's just gonna be another statistic and that's not what I want. I want I wanna make changes in her name. I'm, I want what happened to her to have a purpose. That we are seeking justice They've for always niece. had the heart and the passion. We're not gonna stay silent. We're just gonna keep moving forward. But now, they've found their voice. No longer will they be forgotten.